I let them pick individual stocks. And this is part of my deprogramming for my kids. My philosophy is if they can drive down the street and recognize a McDonald's sign, as soon as that trigger happens, they are old enough to know how to invest. So I Mm -hmm. let them pick companies that they love and companies that they recognize that they would actively be in consumer in and own shares in that. So I deposit a certain amount of money into their custodial brokerage account, UTMA account, every month. And from there, I let them pick stocks in which they can, they want to invest in. And then at the end of the month, we do a comparison on how much they've gained. And it's a little competition for them. And let me tell you something. My four-year-old who was two when she started doing wins every time. She's less emotional than my oldest. Welcome to Super Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Shahid Durrani. Today we have with us Nasima McElroy. Nasima is a published author and the founder of Financially in- Intentional, a platform about personal finance and living life intentionally. Welcome to our show. Hey, <laughs> thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I was just telling you before we start recording how your first name is the same as my mom's name, Nasima. So it was incredible to see the name pop up. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Is there a story behind how you got into this, how you became enthusiastic about finance? Yeah, it's because I don't know about you, Shahid, but I didn't grow up learning about money, right? And so money was always this thing where I knew how to make money. And and then I thought there was this big separation between like real wealthy people and me, people that look like me. So I thought (laughs) all of my friends in school that had money didn't look like me, didn't live in the same neighborhoods as me. And so I used to think that it wasn't for me. And then it got to a point where my daughter was turning one. I was a single mom. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop like being a victim and actually learn about like real wealth. I know how to make money. I was like Instagrammable, had all of the things. Like I had the house, the car, the six figure salary, all of those things that look good on paper. But internally, I knew that I wasn't wealthy. And I, and most importantly, I didn't have anything for my daughter if something were to happen to me in place. And so I was like, I got to figure this out. So that was really the catalyst of me getting on this journey to become financially intentional. Wow. So the name, that's where the name actually comes from as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The name comes from like the intentionality because one of the things that I did on this journey was like, listen to a lot of books and listen to a lot of podcasts. And the word that came up most was intentionality. And then I Mm. noticed that it wasn't about a certain like thing that I did or a certain strategy. It was really the intention behind me really honing in on my skills is what made the difference. And so that's where the, the name came from. Okay. In your journey, what have been some unconventional investment or financial strategies that you have encountered that high output individuals might not consider, but they should. I think one of the most valuable things that I had to do, which costs nothing, is to change my circle of influence. And when Ah. I say change my circle of influence, that means the messages that I'm surrounded with, the people who I receive those messages from. And I think we underestimate how often we get bombarded with messages of consumerism or of not having enough, which drives impulsive spending and things that take you off course for like really building wealth. But once I started to surround myself with the people that I aspire to, and that's not saying that I got rid of my friends. It means that I curated the messages that I was hearing. I didn't watch TV. I only read audio, I only read books, audio books, um, and podcasts. 
And that changed what was normal to me. So all of a sudden I became surrounded by millionaires or people who achieve financial independence. And so those things became normal to me. And later on, those people that I used to listen to and follow and take advice from are actually my everyday friends. They're the people that I spend more time with. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that the subconscious mind had a role in this as well? Oh, definitely. And I think and that's another yeah. thing. I think that we underestimate yeah. the messages that we receive in the background that dictate mm. our behavior. And a lot of those things, mm. like I said, marketing is genius. A lot of those things get into your subconscious. Like for the example, mm. my kids are five months, four and nine, but they know without reading what McDonald's is. They know without reading what Barbie is. Like those things of consumerism and yep. those messages and those distractions are things that are constantly mm -hmm. playing in our head. So unless we intentionally do something to reverse that subconscious programming, then we'll never get to where we want to be. It's so true, Nasima. When I was growing up, I was very much intrigued by action movies. There's bad guys, there's good guys. So I would see that. And then it was in my mind. I, I was consuming so much of it. I was just really into TV watching and movie watching. And I still do, but it was just a different type back then. It was more about action. And then I would see that in my world. I would always be expecting something to happen I'll be driving, okay, someone's going to cut me off and I'm going to get in a, in a road rage. I'm going to get in a fight. And the funny thing is, it would happen. I would literally get in fights. It would be a regular occurrence, not just in, on the road. It would be even at going somewhere, I would, mm -hmm. I would end up in trouble and say, why? I'm not even that kind of guy. Like, why is this happening? Now I know. But mm -hmm. back then, I had no idea that I was actually creating it. And then that media had an influence on me. And yeah. then all the media that you see out there right now, how much influence it has on kids, on people, the games. It's incredible that there's not enough awareness about this. Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about medicine late night, how they show you a uh, disease. And then they, they make the commercial, they make the commercial look like that you have it. And then you start feeling it. What if I have it? And then you start getting symptoms. Because it's no. like you created for yourself. What is that term called? It's a uh, shoot. It's on the tip of my tongue, but <laughs> I can't think of it yeah, either. But that is so true. Yeah. One of the things that I had to do early on too was stop watching the news because I yeah. realized that news in itself was fear mongering. The other mm -hmm. thing that I don't do is I don't allow television in my bedroom. I would never be yeah. one to fall asleep watching television because like you said those kind of commercials air like late night and that goes yeah. into your subconscious and so those yeah. two things have kept me i would say sheltered from a lot of the noise that forms a distraction to whatever goals that you want to meet but also like you said subconsciously it puts you in positions where you do things that aren't even innately part of who you are but it's no, all truly who you are Exactly. Yeah, and it's you, all programming. Yeah. So if you can understand that and reverse engineer it for your better, then that's what you yeah. should be doing. But a lot of it is just like not being able to recognize that. Once you're in it, you don't know. When you're in something, it's hard to know that you're in it. When I was in that world of news, it was an era where I was all about news. Mm -hmm. I had all sorts of apps and they'll give me a ping of summaries and and all the time and I'll be sharing these news and I look back and I think about it. I try not to think of the past, but if when I do, I look at that time and say, oh my God, I was actually part of that fear promotion. I was actually helping in programming of others to be in fear and not understand their true potential, but because I didn't even know there's a true potential hidden within me. Yeah, so. <laughs> and, mo and, and most people just, they don't know. And you don't know no. what you don't know until you no, change you don't that know. circle of influence. Yes, that's great. <laughs> well, I'm glad to have you on the show. It's a really nice conversation. Yes. So can you walk us through a day in your life of financial planning? How do you incorporate wealth building with your daily routine? So I'm the kind of person, because I'm a single mom, I have three little kids, and I work full time as I can a nurse. Hear one. 
Yeah. <laughs> There's a little baby <laughs> in the background. That's my five month old. She's my little sidekick. Right now she's fighting sleep, but I have to do things that aren't going to require a lot. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions that I had is that building wealth or investing had to look like, you remember the Eddie Murphy movie? Hold on. Trading Places. Hold on one second. Yes. Yes. Eddie Murphy's hilarious. What happened to him? I wonder. Oh, he's still around. He's still he's around. He, he hasn't come in any new movies though. Right? Uh, he's okay. I think he's doing, I don't know. I don't know what he's doing. But anyway, that movie Trading <laughs> Places, right? And yeah. like when they're on the trading floor and they're like selling those stocks. And I was yeah. like, I don't know what's going on here, but I know those yeah. guys are rich. And that's what yeah. I thought investing was. And so I yeah. thought I needed like this PhD level of understanding in order to learn how to invest. And then once I got like in this community of people that did that regularly, I realized, and forgive me, I'm from Oakland. I realized that investing was just hella easy and it didn't have to be all this crazy stuff. So what I have done is set up systems in my life where it runs in the background so that I can just continue Automated. to do exactly continue to do all the crazy stuff that I have to do in my life on a day to day basis. Right. So it's a set it and forget it for me. Like I set some. Whoa things up early on in my life and in my kids' life that just runs in the background so that I don't even have to think about it. It's very passive. It's automated, like you said, and it's simple. Great. Can you share some of the investments that you're involved with? Yes. Or like On a very high level. And you, and you said like day-to-day, -day. like I said, I don't do things like investing I mean, like day-to-day, like, -day, but on a high level, yeah. like what I make sure that I always do while I'm working I always max out my 403B and I work for a government mm -hmm. organization. So that's like a 401k. The benefit of a 403B when you work for a government organization is that you also have what's called a, dis a deferred savings account or a 457, which has the same mm -hmm. tax advantages of your 403B. So for example, if I make $100,000 a year and I the max to contribute to a 403B or 401k is $20,000 a year, I also get another $20,000 a year for to contribute to my 457, right? So that automatically mm -hmm. drops my taxable income to $60,000 versus $100,000. And so that lowers my tax mm -hmm. my taxable um, income, mm -hmm. right? So I'm automatically put in a different tax bracket. Good. So I do that first because I am a very high earning nurse in the San Francisco Bay Area and, and I make more than hundred thousand dollars. So awesome. that's at a that's at a high level. I always make sure that on top of that, I contribute to a Roth IRA. And because I am a high earning nurse and there is income, there are income limits to a Roth IRA. I have to do what's called a backdoor Roth. Like I said, this is a very high level. I'll be happy to go into details about that. How I do that, but it's pretty simple. So four, five, uh, 403B, 457, Roth IRA for myself. For my children, I have dedicated like enough money to, for my older two, they each have enough in a 529 or a college savings fund. So they'll each have $100,000 for them to go to school to fund whatever education they want to do. Or if they don't want to go to school, it'll be like, you know, a family savings plan. Then they mm -hmm. also have their Roth IRA. So if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see that my kids are in a lot of the branded um, collaborations that I do because they work for me. Therefore, they have earned income. And that means that they can contribute to a Roth IRA themselves up to how much they uh, could potentially earn or whatever the Roth IRA limit is. And then for them, I also have a brokerage account. And this is the only kind of account where I do individual stocks. And I'll talk to you about like how I invest in those other accounts after this, but I let them pick individual stocks. And this is part of my deprogramming for my kids. My philosophy is if they can drive down the street and recognize a McDonald's sign, as soon as that trigger happens, they are old enough to know how to invest. So I let them pick companies that they love 
and companies that they recognize that they would actively be in consumer in and own shares in that. So I deposit a certain amount of money into their custodial brokerage account at my account every month. And from there, I let them pick stocks in which they can, they want to invest in. And then at the end of the month, we do a comparison on how much they've gained. And it's a little competition for them. And let me tell you something. My four-year-old who was two when she started That's doing awesome. this, inve- uh, yeah. she wins every time. She's less emotional nice. than my oldest daughter. <laughs> yeah. so That's awesome. She's, oh, yeah. I'm using my Apple iPhone. I'm going to oh. invest in Apple. And those are the accounts that I have set up for them. But the reason why investing for me is really simple and takes or took away like this whole burden of having this PhD level of knowledge is that once I got, once I became part of the financially independent community, I truly learned about investing. And that's when I got introduced to index funds and realized that it was smarter to just own the whole market versus trying to beat the market. And on average, that's adjusted for inflation, about an 8% return. And that sounded really good to me. So I just buy index funds and all of my investments, Mm. automate those investments and just leave it alone. Kudos to you for you're a perfect example of the uh, incredible parent, the work that you're doing for them at that age. They're definitely going to remember that and thank you for it when they're older. It's a priceless knowledge. My next question is, how does anybody join your circle of influence? I would say the first step is just follow me on my social media. Like I said, I'm, I feel like that's that's free, right? You can get to know me. Yeah. You can join my um, financially intentional Facebook group. But I'm heavy on Instagram, and I drop a lot of gems there. First of all, I, and I'm not for everybody, right? Not everybody is gonna like me, and that's okay because I don't have to be for everybody. But well, it's it, the same that, with it, everyone, yeah. Exactly. Mm. And see if you like me, if you vibe with me. And then I do have some resources, like I have a membership community, which I go through the steps to personal to financial independence. And then I have some ebooks there. Other than that, like I'm really heavy into just like dropping free game, sharing transparently, like what my life is like, like, I I may look young, but I am 42 years old, just had another baby and all the ups and downs. Congratulations. And yeah, thank Mm. you. And so there's a lot of that life (laughs) that gets exposed Mm. there just because people need to know what's possible for them because it's so easy for people to say, I can't do this because, but I like to Mm. lean into, I have done this in spite of, so. Yeah, check yeah. it out. Nasima, if you had to start from scratch today, yes. knowing all that's going on in news with the uh, extreme recession coming or all the fear that's going on, what steps would you take to build wealth if you had to start today after watching this episode? So if I had to start over and I was at a place mm. where I had debt, I would create a plan. First of all, I would always ensure that I understood exactly how much I needed to live. Then I would create a budget as to where, first of all, I knew that I was making more than what I was spending, which a lot of people don't even understand what they're spending. And that's number one. So understand that. And then I would aggressively create a plan to be able to both eliminate any debt that I have and also be investing because millionaires, billionaires are made in recessions. And so instead of Mm, looking at this as a time of like scarcity and fear, I look at it as a time of building and leaning into that. Mm. Mm, Yeah, it's a very good opportunity. If you look at the Great Depression in the 20s, it was bad times for people. It was really bad times, but then there were so many millionaires created. What was the difference? Is their mindset was the difference, mm-hmm. how they mm-hmm. were thinking, how they were looking at this whole thing. So thank you for sharing that point. Can you share with us what you feel your innermost superpower is that got you to this point in life? I think my innermost superpower is knowing that failure is only, is mandatory on the pathway to success, right? It's a yes. marathon. Good. And that failure doesn't mean that I failed. It means that I tried. And Mm, so whenever things are wrong, and I've had a lot of stops and starts in life, 
I mm-hmm. always look at the opportunities for growth within that and move on. Very good. That's such an important point because we look at failure as an extremely negative occurrence, but there's always a hidden message. There's a learning lesson, opportunity, something that you can gain from it. That's why we experienced it. It makes our future decisions much better because of that learning experience. Yeah. Can you also share with us if you dabble in Bitcoin? <laughs> The the most that I dabbled in Bitcoin was in 2020 when I just opened a Robinhood account. And first of all, <laughs> don't do that. But I just put a little bit of money in there or I had money in there. Actually, I had Robinhood a long time ago. So I was just like, oh, I have some extra money in here. I'll buy some Bitcoin. And that's about it. My rule of thumb when it comes to investing is if I can't understand it and teach it to my kids and they be able to repeat it back to me. I probably won't invest in it. Mm. And Bitcoin is still something that kind of baffles me. I don't really understand how it works. And I know it's innovative in some kind of way. So with those kind of investments, I always treat it like if you have some throwaway money or anything less than 10% of what you would invest anyway, you can put it on those experimental things. Great. Amazing. <laughs> appreciate your time today for coming on our show and sharing your wisdom. And it was great that you have experienced this. And also you're sharing that legacy, that experience to your kids. That was the biggest benefit I got from meeting you today is what you're doing with your kids. Mm -hmm. That is very unique, very special. What you're creating in their mind is a completely different world Right. That they're going to grow up into. It's just incredible. And I appreciate you for doing that and wishing you all the best. Thank you. And I hope I made your mom proud. Yeah, <laughs> I'll find out. <laughs> Thank tell you so her much. Her name says hi. <laughs> yes, I'll tell her that you have, the, you have the same name and she's doing great work with her kids. Thank you. Appreciate you. And keep in touch. We'll send you an email once the episode goes live. And we'll appreciate you if you can help us promote it. And uh, if there's anything else in the future, let us know. Definitely. I appreciate it. It It's a great conversation. Thank you. Same here.